This is my desktop. I use my background to organize my projects. Besides my main PhD research, I have a million side quests going on at any given time. On one of these projects, Superfluid, I talk with experts from as wide of a range of fields as possible and try to understand the fundamental principles of their domains. For example, I've talked with Fei Chen. These two cell types, like where is that information stored? A former electrical engineer who's now a professor investigating spatial and temporal genomics. Matt Petrick, a spirits like, expert. Uh, Guayacal and things like that. Who leverages his systems engineering background to explain the worlds of rum and cocktails. And Lupe Fiasco. I'm on hat eight miles shit. Who's at MIT as a visiting scholar and teaching a course on the fundamentals of rap. When I first met Lupe at the Trope Tank, I also met his comparative media studies compatriot, Alberto Angelini, AKA Albert Figure. So desktop narratives everywhere. And then I was thinking, okay, question mark or exclamation mark. Let's go for the internal bank, which is desktop narratives everywhere. I asked about his work. And even though we talked for quite some time, I honestly still felt like I had no idea what he did. Afterwards, I found him online and his LinkedIn profile looked pretty normal. Independent researcher, Fulbright scholar at MIT, professor, and then I found some interesting and honestly confusing videos that he's created. And now we'll pass the line again to the Zooniverse. I'm not really sure how to interpret them, but they are really eye-catching. And he also seems to be part of a band. I finally found a research blog that he authors focused on desktop narratives, which gave me the most insight on what he does. Well, not only does he do... Sorry, uh, scroll down a little bit. Uh, sorry. No, no problem. Uh, not only does he do that, but he does this. Well, all of this is what he does. He uses things like this and this and this to make things like these. He uses video as a means to create art and film and deeply inspects how things like frames and videos are used for storytelling. Okay, but could you explain that a little bit more? I could, but I'd rather just talk to Albert. Well, we started with a, a paranoid double check and now quoting my my host here, yes. Bobby, 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 how, how open the whole should be? So it's a good question. At MIT, it's become very open okay. because you have like people from Israel or people from the Middle East that it's usually more like a booby. Booby. Yeah. Like, uh, and then people in the Midwest, it's more of like a babby. Babby. Yeah. Babby. Uh, Almost all the vowels you can cycle through and I won't be mad at you. Wow. <laughs> so booby, babby, bibi, bobby. I, I yeah. think the traditional one is more of like a bobby. Bobby. Like bobby. Yeah. Um, but I don't care. Any of them. Just don't call me Phil. Very good. Yeah. yeah. I was quoting you, in fact, because the paranoid double check could be a good starting point. In fact, we were double checking now the cameras. No, we want to be sure that they're functioning. They are operating. That They won't uh, somehow get lost along the way with us talking into the void. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we were also discussing the microphone, the setting, and also the final destination of this video, YouTube. And also this series of videos starting as a podcast, although a visual one, but then incorporating more and more visual elements because you can easily listen to a podcast, even if it's a video. But if the video podcast is heavily based on video snippets, and this is something that we will try to do today, then it's going to be difficult to just listen to that. Right. So I think we don't necessarily need to be uh, paranoid or to describe ourselves as such. But uh, this idea of overthinking about borders, mm. frames, and just like, yeah, it's like this perimeter in which you insert your action or your activity or your artistic practices in has always been with me. So this is a big issue in uh, cinema studies, also uh, in academia. So I've been studying cinema. So I've been offered uh, hours of meditative lessons by teachers that were rambling about movies, but the movies were never there. 
originally because it was maybe difficult to have them there. I mean, mm. nowadays people just like use YouTube or other uh, channels, mm. uh, just like uh, video sharing um, repository to retrieve data while speaking. Just like, hey, now that I think about it. So, but back in the days, and I'm not talking about Jurassic times, I'm talking about <laughs> uh, 15 years ago, uh, we were still battling between VHS, LaserDisc, DVD, and also those uh, possibilities were not just like on your fingertips. I mean, maybe the teacher was speaking about uh, a director, he could have brought a DVD in, but then you need to insert the DVD, search for the point. It's not just like uh, point and click. So I think the biggest revolution of YouTube, apart from having such a, an enormous mass of content, also user generated, is that you can very much manipulate, finally, to the detail, to the mm. tiny little detail, your information. So it's the ultimate domestication of audiovisual uh, content. So it's a problem because actually I was talking with my friend today. He's like, oh yeah, I'm talking with a guy later on. Like, oh, what does he do? Like, I don't really know. Um, I mean, I know what you do, but I don't know how to say what you do. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping I can figure that out in the next couple of hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's difficult for me to just very quickly describe what I do, but we can use some some keywords, okay? So I think mostly uh, my orientation in terms of um, creative outcome is towards audiovisual, so moving images. So I could describe myself as a director, or a video maker, or a video artisan. Usually I go for that. It's mm. not that popular. Actually, I'm probably one of the very few people in the world uh, using that. Because uh, video artist is a possibility. But I don't know. It's a little bit of a burden to me, this, this thing that you have to remind people that you are an artist. So actually, I'm a maker, maybe. Yeah, but video maker is at the same time a little confusing because it was originally attached to people using video cameras, doing maybe underground stuff with uh, portable electronic devices compared to directors that were using celluloid in cinema. So directors, you imagine somebody with a scarf, with a hat, just like, action! It's, it's not me. It's too much. Video maker, maybe somebody doing some guerrilla movie on the streets, yeah. on just like very involved, I don't know. And it's, it's not video anymore. It's, it's digital video, it's something different. And um, video art is usually video art is about a single channel installation, uh, very long and slowly paced movies in uh, um, exhibition spaces, art galleries. So video artisan, for me, it's, it's the best. Of course, it takes a little while to like video artisan. So what is that? It's like, well, it's just like, um, first of all, well, what is the difference between an artist and an artisan? The artisan is working on similar things constantly, no? So just like it's I'm polishing and refining this little hmm. audiovisual shoes of mine. It's right. like, it's just like I'm producing several iterations of the same. And I'm not driven to the next big ideas. I'm not searching for necessarily fame or visibility. Because artists are about just like, I'm going to be the next artist in that gallery. I'm going to be hitting uh, just a new record with this new incredible idea or maybe I'm gonna stay awake all night because I'm searching for this no 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 that is a strange mismatch so people are just like by the time they know that I'm a director just like oh are you famous right. I mean well, what kind of question is that like <laughs> you, you don't ask that to uh, I don't know a vegetable vendor right. what's your occupation um, I sell vegetables are you famous is that no, but director or regista, as we say in Italy. <laughs> so it's just like, it's so full of, of pride and honor, just like, mm. it's too much. So video artists, I'm just like, yo, I, I do my little things one at a time, possibly incrementally. And this is one reason to call myself a video artisan. The other reason is that a video nowadays, it's ubiquitous. So it's not just like I work with celluloids and then I need a bunch of people helping me develop that footage so it's just like uh, we work with digital files so i could be making a documentary i could be making a web snippet for somebody i could be working on some uh, uh, desktop narrative in fact we're going to talk about that prepare some video tapestry for a theater piece i'm telling you things that i did in my life so just like it's just like you work with leather so you're an artisan leather is nothing leather is just an idea 
you can make uh, shoes, you can make a pocket, you can make a belt, but you don't make leather, right? Mm. So leather is there. Mm. And so the same goes for video. So my video artisan, now you think about leather, you replace it with video. So I can be uh, useful in many capacities. Right. And uh, video is going to be my language. Right. But also, just to make things a little bit more complicated, video is composed nowadays, I mean, already a century, also of audio. So you have audio visual. That's why I always use this word. People tell me that uh, it's a very old fashioned word, audio visual. Ah, from the 70s, what is that? Hmm. Well, you have to remind people because then you have that kind of intricacy listening to a Spotify episode that originally was a video podcast. What's going on there? So are you listening to the radio or you are watching uh, Spotify? What what happens? So audiovisual is important. So I play with video, yes. There is an audio component and that's my second expertise. I'm a musician, so video artisan and musician. And in audiovisual, you have both. You have rhythm, you have images or my visual cultural studies, and then theory and occasional teaching and workshopping. Right. And, oops, I'm sorry. <laughs> no worries. Conversation like this. So by way of analogy, if you talk to a physics professor, they might be like, oh, like, like how did you get here? It's like, well... I was really good in math in high school and I got involved in research and then I went to college and I did more physical research and then I really was interested in this idea of dark matter and how it makes up a lot of the universe we can't see it and then I just have basically spent the past 30 years trying to find it and that's how I that's how I got to where I am today. This is one of the reasons why talking to you is so interesting because it's like it's a part of my brain that I've never used before. All right. like, wow, like what the hell? So like how did you get here? Okay. So it's always this idea of looking possibly outside of the frame, looking at uh, the borders, just like incidentally, just like tangentially. Yeah. Is it the word? Yeah. Uh, yep. uh, so I was born and raised in the 80s, okay. the apex of color, uh, colorful commercial TV. Sure. And especially in Italy, we were preparing for the ventennial of Silvio Berlusconi. Um, as a prime minister, mm -hmm. but he is also a media mogul. So just hmm. like we had 20 years of fascism and then later on 20 years of uh, videocracy, as they call it. So that was the pre-production phase sure. in the end. It's just like commercial television, uh, just picking your brain. And uh, fortunately, luckily, my parents uh, didn't want me to, to be exposed to this kind of potentially risky uh, activity hmm. so they uh, took me away from TV but once again terminology is important they didn't take me away from TV per se just like the device the black box that is sitting in your living room they took me away from commercial TV and sometimes also from national TV you know we have this subdivision in Italy and so you have uh, state funded channels and mm, then you have private right. channels uh, so they somehow they were stimulating me in using the TV screen as a monitor. So providing me with a, a video cassette recorder. And also, since my father was an early adopter of uh, uh, video making technologies, as an amateur, as a doctor, so it's not a video maker, mm -hmm. uh, they also provide me with a camera, a little portable camera. So mm -hmm. I was a video maker as a child. Mm -hmm. And the TV was always there uh, just like as a feedback. Also, I was getting hypnotized by feedback loop by pointing the camera at the TV. So I was playing around with the yeah. with the very device. I was provided probably with a good recipe. So mm. just like a lot of music. My mother is a musician. She's a violin teacher. Okay. And uh, a lot of interestingly stimulating technique. My father is a doctor, so he's on, on the scientific side. He's a chess player. He mm. was uh, also tinkering with informatics. So we okay. had some early Macintosh mm. machine in our house. So you have... The musical side from my mother and to say the more uh, romantic or maybe also novel oriented side she's a great reader mm. and a technical computational just like uh, info related side from my father so right. the tv was a monitor i had the camera i was listening to music i was trying to learn several instruments at a time as a child you have a very big plasticity and if you're encouraged to do that right those are very precious here so i guess i hope a lot to my parents. They're great. 
and um, and also to the fact that they were this uh, interesting uh, match of two, mm. uh, let's say, approaches to to life and creativity. Mm. What I'm trying to say is that they provided me with a tool, not necessarily with a catalog, just like, right. now you don't watch commercial television because we don't want you to be interrupted by advertising and uh, brainwash. Mm. You watch the whole collection of uh, animation. Mm. No, 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 just that you watch whatever you want. And actually, even better, you make it. Right. So then did you carry this through through? Your schooling in college, I guess? Not at all. Uh, not until <laughs> university. <laughs> Compulsory uh, school. It's um, it's usually very dull. And also, uh, there is not a lot of emphasis on these themes. Maybe nowadays it's a little mm-hmm. bit different for the same reason that we were discussing before. So, this uh, user-friendly interfaces. You have, I don't know, uh, uh, maybe electronic blackboard. So, you can do a lot right. of things. You can connect. You can show things. But uh, in the 80s and in the 90s, school was very sad. Sometimes in Italy, you have the impression that school is meant to be uh, just like, um, yeah, very dry. So just hmm. like, we, we're not having fun here. It's not supposed to happen. Well, every pedagogist knows perfectly that playful thinking and just like uh, game-oriented uh, yeah. sharing of knowledge is the best way to achieve and to memorize mm-hmm. uh, concepts. But apparently this notion didn't arrive in Italy. Although we had wonderful example of parallel schooling, just like the Montessori, uh, the, the Montessori approach that is very prominent in other states, uh, encouraging the student to be creative, not just to regurgitate. So I had a hard time in school. This was uh, sad because I was not a bad student. I was okay. Sometimes even more than okay. But I was always uh, bored, constantly bored, up to the university. Actually, I was kicked out. Uh, of school hmm. twice in my high school oh, secondary, yeah. conflicts wow. with the teachers conflicts about once again methodology it's all about the frame it's all about the paranoid hmm. check so i want to step out of this frame in the 90s i mean we were studying medieval literature divine comedy memorizing those lines beautifully written but i go home and there is something called the internet there and i'm sending an email I'm firing signals over the ocean, speaking with people from the University of Berkeley. And my father is playing chess telematically with people in France. And my mother is, is, is digitizing cassettes of her early recordings. And then I go to school and there is somebody telling me, I don't know what a computer is. I'm not interested. This is not relevant. Let's go with Dante. Wow. What's going on here? So big conflicts. And not because I didn't want to study, not because I didn't want to concentrate mm-hmm. or just like be there physically present. It's because those were, those usually are the best years of somebody's life. Right. The most, just like, uh, I mean, you're blooming, right? <laughs> and uh, what a waste of time. What a waste of energy. What Agreed. a waste of neuron mm-hmm. plasticity. Mm-hmm. That's Agreed. it. So university was possibly the way out. Mm-hmm. But not necessarily, because uh, I ended up enrolling in the DAMS, D-A-M-S, Disciplines of Arts, Music and Spectacle. It's a faculty that's been funded in the mm. 70s by Umberto Eco, one of the greatest thinkers of uh, Italy, uh, recently mm. passed out. And uh, so it was a combination of uh, semiotics, cinema studies, mm. and uh, philosophy. Interesting, but theoretical. I say striking idea was, why don't we apply the same rigor and let's say the same textual criticism that we apply to Dante also to Mickey Mouse or to Fellini that is the powerful idea behind that similar mm-hmm. to what happens here with uh, comparative media studies right. but uh, we were not meant to produce any videos so the real shift occurred while I was attending university by the beginning of the 2000s digital editing arrived and so hmm. I finally understood that I could go back to my childhood games because i stopped making videos when i was 12 or 14 i somehow shifted to music right also because video was difficult and excruciating and slow almost impossible i was trying to edit with two video cassette recorder or with tape i mean incredibly complicated times once again not talking about uh it was like prehistoric (laughs) times talking about some years ago and uh yeah 
And so Final Cut, digital editing was the moment in which I said, okay, I can jump out of university and I can do that mm-hmm. by retrieving my childhood memory. Actually, I was studying myself. I was studying my own tapes because oh, everybody wow. is a genius as a child. Even mm-hmm. you were a genius. And, uh, but then we forget. Just like I didn't know anything about cinema when I was experimenting with camera, but I was absorbing information from the, the language of cinema, right. also from the language of reality, and also from the language of the metaphysical world of a, of a child where everything is, is magic, right? right. Yeah. So I didn't conceive the idea, okay, I have to edit this. This is going to be complicated. I simply didn't care. I was editing on tape, which is a good exercise that you can do. Just like not this kind of surrounding here. So this is very uh, pre-organized. So we have two cameras mm-hmm. and then we're going to edit in post-production microphones. Talking about sequential editing for narrative purposes. So you want to have a, a scene in which somebody is, I don't know, trapped in a room. Right. And then there is a killer. I, I was passionate with this kind of uh, <laughs> horror, just like as any child. I was. I wanted sure. to uh, re- represent what I was reading in genre literature into. So just like you want to have a thriller suspense scene. So you immediately think about, okay, I'm going to intercut. I mean, now I'm, t- I'm using technical jargon. So mm-hmm. parallel editing, intercutting. Mm-hmm. But then as a child, just like, okay. So I used my, my friends as uh, victims. I just like, uh, I was experimenting with them. Just like, okay, so you stay there. So you ask her, I'm going to pen on you. And then, okay, wait. And then I went out. So it's like, okay, now you're running. Let's come. Okay, stop. <laughs> stop there. I'm going to come back in five minutes. Then you go. So just like you're editing on camera. Wow. Right? But also, the the timing was perfect. So it's like because I was calculating. Also, there is a moment in which the, the tape was rewinding a little bit. So you were somehow eating up. A couple of seconds. I was also thinking. So that kind of very um tactical meaning yeah. also the, the the just like the handy right handiness is involved just like i was thinking about how to get into the that rhythm and guess what the rhythm is also behind the music that's why i mm. ended up from piano that was my classical instrument to satisfy my mother's desire to drumming and drumming is good when you're editing so hmm. you see oh, everything is connected so i was studying my tapes yeah. After 10 years, as a person in his early 20s, I was studying myself as an early teenager. Wow. Just like, that is that is interesting. Also, the point of view. I mean, this is an incredible point of view. I mean, little by little, you start to censor yourself in a lot of ways. Also, you, you reduce the amount of information that your senses are going to absorb. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I was studying myself. And then I was starting to study the software, <laughs> of course. Right. And then I ended up uh, working for TV and then on independent documentaries, a little bit of video art exhibition and then the theater and then uh, new media, um, yeah, experimental piece. All the things that I was mentioning before Mm -hmm. while applying the metaphor ladder, Mm -hmm. they were not just like randomly picked. They were just like things that I was doing as Mm -hmm. an artisan Mm -hmm. while becoming one. So you're at MIT currently. Mm-hmm. Why are you at MIT? How did you get to MIT? What are you doing at MIT? Okay, basically, um, long story short, I'm here because of a scholarship. Okay. Uh, it's a Fulbright scholarship, in fact. So Fulbright is one of the most renowned scholarship. It's also very old. That's probably why. 75 mm-hmm. years hmm. of experience. It was established soon after the Second World War. And uh, they were um, organizing exchanges between scholars, teachers, PhD candidates, uh, students, I mean, all sort of people within academia in order to possibly expand the spectrum of ideas. Yeah. So in order to encourage a dialogue instead of mm. conflicts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which is probably the best uh, description. Um, so it's important that people uh, meet and talk and also mingle and, and they combine their point of view. It's yeah. also the, the, the primary goal of universities when they were funded in Italy, actually. This is for real some time ago. Wow. And uh, so basically, uh, I've been teaching American exchange students for a number of years in Italy, study abroad students mm-hmm. on topics ranging from the history of cinema, 
the history of Italian cinema, uh, digital editing or montage, and then mass media and communications. You were at a, you were at a university. In Italy? Yeah, I was just like freelancing as okay. an adjunct teacher, uh-huh. as uh, somebody who was not uh, within academia deeply with a PhD. Sure. Uh, so I was offering sometimes a theoretical course, but most of the time also mixed hybrid course which is mm. like a little bit of theory a little bit of mm. practice mm-hmm. precisely the kind of thing that i would have uh, loved to have uh, in <laughs> high school or at least in the university right. so while i was uh, teaching american students uh, they were always suggesting me why don't you try fulbert Th- that is great i mean you should do that it's mm. the, it's perfect for you and i was always saying yeah but uh, i can't because at this very moment I'm freelancing as a video artisan or a musician. And when I'm teaching, I'm just freelancing as a teacher. I'm not affiliated with any institution or university. Uh, uh-huh. I'm not getting a PhD. I'm not a student anymore. I'm definitely not a scholar. Maybe I'm an independent scholar. That's what I am. In fact, I'm collaborating a lot with a think tank in Amsterdam called the INC, Institute of Network Cultures. Hmm. We can also add some links here yeah, by I'll the time we edit um, that. And... Uh, so I'm definitely very interested into uh, research and critical theory, but uh, I'm an independent. So uh, this was the case until 2019. And then, surprisingly enough, somebody told me, you remember that Fulbright thing? So now, now you can apply because they open up a new position specifically customized around independent oh, researcher wow. in the art field. So not even independent researcher, but also in the art field, just like, oh. wow, this is a call to action. Hmm. This is a perfect description of what I do. Finally, I know what I'm doing. It's just like, hmm. by the time Bobby's going to ask me, <laughs> I can tell you what I'm doing. Fulbright told me that. So um, I was applying and uh, I ended up winning it. So you're looking at the first specimen of wow. uh, Italian Fulbright funded independent uh, scholar Excellent. in the art field. But by the time I was submitting my application, it was February 2020. I don't know if you remember. Uh, uh, we had deeply. Uh, we, yeah. had, we had some problems back there, <laughs> especially in Italy. I was in Milan, the eye of the storm, wow. the first metropolis to collapse in the Western world. I was just like submitting the application. I'm not mentioning all the bureaucratic riddles sure. and problems. So I'm just like panicking and just like running until the very last minute just to be able to hand it. And after one week, we were in total national lockdown. So just like, okay, wow. uh, maybe it's time to concentrate on something else now. <laughs> so yeah, everybody was uh, not necessarily terrified, but very confused. And also um, future plans were just like immediately d- destroyed. And so little by little, uh, I saw that I forgot about Fulbright, but the thing was postponed. So it was postponed several times. Right. So we had to procrastinate also meeting and just like agreement with several institutions. Mm-hmm. So the original plan was to go to another city, to another institution. Actually, it was Chicago, mm-hmm. possibly Columbia Film School, because mm-hmm. I wanted to be in an art school. Sure. So I was visiting Chicago. It's a city that I know I have friends there. And so basically I was trying to understand if that was a good place to go. And probably, yeah, the plan could have been functional. But the pandemic... Uh, forced me to rearrange everything and so in the end they asked me to change institution and maybe to find something else because the Chicago institutions were not responding to me and even a replacement that I found in New York I mean with the second quarantine people were even more confused especially about international right visitors especially yeah. here in the states I mean you reopened after a year and a half last November so no matter what, even if the institution was reopening for you guys, right. I was the problem. And okay. since Fulbright is connected to international traveling, so you have to step on American soil so <laughs> they can give you the money and they can start the program just if you're here. There is no hybrid possibility or remote possibility. Right. So I had to wait. And there was a moment in which they asked me to play some sort of a bet. It's just like, unfortunately, people are waiting. There is a role. So it's like this thing is moving. We, the world is trying to catch up and restart. So we cannot wait anymore. I mean, you can shop for alternatives from the Hawaii to, I don't know, right. Montana. And this is what I did, actually. Just really? like shopping for possibilities. Yeah, because the bad side was crap. I won this prestigious award. 
I'm the first one to be allowed to conduct research on an independent level. So this is even, for me, more prestigious than the Fulbright itself, right. to be an independent scholar that is recognized as valuable, mm -hmm. even if it's not associated with an institution, mm -hmm. right? And so basically, uh, I was a little pissed off because of that. But on the flip side, I was just like, wow, now that I have the grants, it was easier to contact people because before the application, I was contacting university wow. just like, in case I win this thing that is also new, so uh, let me explain right. that I'm not affiliated because there is a new, but so it was very complicated for a non-affiliated to explain the non-affiliation process. Uh, but soon after, just like I can call or, or reach uh, out to anybody. Mm -hmm. Of course, everybody was confused, somebody was not responding, but sure. the good part is that I could virtually be wherever I want. But that mm -hmm. deadline, you have to place some sort of a bet, so it's not now researching is gambling, <laughs> some sort of gambling. So you place a bet on some institution. Mm -hmm. If they're okay in hosting you, the moment they reopen, you're safe. If they don't reopen, or if they open just for national students and not for you, Sorry, I mean, oh, you placed the wrong wow. bet. And so I was just trying to understand which was the best possible choice. So MIT was not at all in the range of my thoughts. And then I was starting to think, maybe I should place my bet on a big institution. In fact, so big that it's forced to reopen one way or another. Maybe in the end, it's going to reopen just for people within the state. Right. But who knows? And then I was remembering a wonderful book that is called The New Media Reader. That is a collection of anthology. Uh, chronically in the idea of hypertextual narrative and uh, user interface from Jorge Luis Borges to HTML, that is the, the subtext. So just like this idea from narrative experiments mm. to just like protocols mm -hmm. on the web, it's just one line. You, we don't have to think about humanities here and uh, computer science there. Actually, oh. there are, especially when it comes to information processing, there's a lot of... And so I was thinking about that book, thinking about the curator, Nick Monfort, the trope tank, MIT, reaching out to him, we didn't know each other, and it was okay with playing the game, just like right. placing the bet. Yeah, And we had to wait a little more, Delta, Omicron, but finally after two years, February 2020, February 2022, I arrived here. That's it. That's the end of the story. Wow. I did not know oh, maybe that, the that story. Maybe yeah. yeah, the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, the end of the beginning of the story. The, the beginning of the end or the end of the beginning. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I had no idea that that was the path. Um, but given that you're at the point, so you're in February 2022, do you want to walk me through what the past seven months were like? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I can do that. Yeah. So, so basically, um, I'm coming from a mixed background. So there is music, there is video. There is a little bit of academia. I basically, I, I did my studies. I wanted to also shop for different possibilities mm. within university. So I was doing this uh, course in Bologna and I finally graduated from that. And then also a course about digital media in Amsterdam that is connected to the think tank whose links are appearing somewhere. And, um, and then recently, I mean, uh, for the past years before the pandemic, I was splitting between creative activity, freelancing as a video right. maker, uh, working with the theater, experimental pieces, uh, translation sometimes, editing. So just a lot of little jobs yeah. and, uh, and also teaching. That was the bigger gig. I was still a geek, but it was involving cinematography experimental digital uh, possibilities within cinematography mm -hmm. and getting uh, the kids uh, ready to to process this idea that you can study cinema but nowadays it's even better if you study that through uh, making it right. the Fulbright thing is coming in perfect timing although then the timing of coming here was a little bit uh, yeah. uh, problematic because it's an achievement so it's what I do is combining my creativity with the theory actually i came up with a term that is creativity theory and that is what i try to do is my escamotage as the french say or escamontage so it's just like i'm, I'm editing my practice trying to incorporate theory into mm. art and try to incorporate creativity into right. critical reasoning so uh in the end even if it's a serendipity and it was a series of serendipity in fact and it was a little painful Coming here was the best possible uh, plan B because uh, although unanticipated, MIT is on the same 
pets, no? Mm-hmm. Mans and manus, which is like mm-hmm. your mind and your hands. Mm-hmm. So basically film and music or creativity and theory, getting your hands dirty with mm-hmm. film and also thinking about that. Mm-hmm. My final layer, the cherry on top, was about desktop narrative. So just like the idea that you can have audiovisual storytelling within the perimeter of a screen. Mm. So paranoid, uh, double check. So the screen is there. Right. You can observe everything from the outside point of view. Try to understand if you can reach a point in which you don't need necessarily a camera, a tripod, sequential editing, additional soundtrack, and not even somebody acting. But uh, you can focus on the activity uh, inside the screen. So let's imagine you record your activity on a screen. Mm-hmm. That is what I call desktop narrative. Of course, you have to subdivide the possibilities because nowadays, especially on YouTube, you have some trendy feds, tutorials. Sure. They were there also in the 90s, but nowadays are coming back yeah. in uh, in style. And then you have video game playthrough. A lot of uh, right. YouTube stars are just like playing video games, so <laughs> they record what they're looking at. Mm-hmm. You have response videos, so you have this kind of mm-hmm. A conflation of shot and counter shot. I'm mm-hmm. looking at this. I react, and and then you have a video essay. So all of these things are somehow desktop narrative because what you see mostly the overarching framework is a desktop, and then somebody is doing something. You can see the face of the person. You can see just the cursor, mm-hmm. the pointing device. Yeah. My focus was to uh, possibly study the past, the present, and the future of desktop cinema. So, meaning desktop feature film. So, instead of a tutorial, which is practical, instead of a response video, which is some sort of a mimetic way to address content nowadays, hmm. instead of a video essay, which are, is meant to be instructional, uh, a desktop narrative film is just like a story that is unraveling on a screen. So, that is my interest. So, the project of Fulbright my application was about desktop cinematic storytelling. So mm. how uh, it works, where it's coming from, where it's going, what are the possibility. So studying a little bit uh, the technical side of that, but also the creative side of that. And here at MIT, at the Troop Tank, it was um, incredibly fun and inspirational mm. to conduct uh, my research Surrounded by retro computing, uh, <laughs> let's say, um, devices, yeah. and also this idea that humanities, in fact, have to be coupled with uh, with uh, computer science. Right. You have a very unique path compared to most people have interacted with here at MIT. Um, like, like, like most people have this path of, well, I was really good in physics, and then I did that for, and then I was the, the international math Olympiad champion, and like now I'm here. Um, and that's probably because I don't talk to a lot of people in comparative media studies compared to like physics or biology or whatever. But just hearing the path is like. Uh, one thing that I've been doing here in these six months is trying to investigate the, the long and sometimes uh, counterintuitive or strange or, uh, say, clumsy history of. Uh, screenshotting before and then screen hmm. casting afterwards and now hmm. just like we are streaming all sort of content the pandemic of course uh impacted us uh, so the idea is that originally in the 60s and early 70s people were trying desperately to communicate what was happening into uh, mainframe uh, labs so just like how can you uh show or showcase what you're doing on a computer to people who are not willing to to come and visit you or they cannot simply be there with you operating these gigantic machines. Uh, So the idea was if we have a video terminal, we can shoot a photo so that we can have a proof of something that is happening and we can talk about that to potential investors, to Mm. curious people, Mm. to students. So originally you were snapping a, a shot of that Maybe by covering the margins, just trying to point an analog photographic device hmm. to a screen that is processing information from a yeah. CPU. So it's a very strange arrangement. It's not easy to to fix an image on a on a regular uh, CRT. So different from a LCD or maybe other displays that we use nowadays, you cannot uh, rely on bitmapping or just like screen recording. You just need to fix that. 
So uh, I was investigating the issue of that, and it's incredible. Also, has to do with MIT here, while they were uh, they were developing CAD and also the School of Architecture and Planning. So, mm-hmm. what is the best way to uh, present our results to the public, uh, or maybe to once again people that want to invest in that, or they right. want to buy the software, mm-hmm. or they want to understand how the software is is working? Mm-hmm. So by s- snapping photos nowadays, it could be a screenshot. I mean, just like nowadays, it's just to have evidence, or maybe to save some very ephemeral content on Snapchat or I don't know Instagram. No, so this is already very interesting. Something that is at the same time so old and so contemporary, but for Totally different reason, no? Right. So it's the idea that nowadays you're simply freezing a moment in time because you are so lazy that you don't want to write that information, so you're snapshotting it, or maybe you want to have proof. I mean, yeah. this guy is insulting me, but maybe he's gonna cancel this message. But I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna frame <laughs> it. Uh huh. <laughs> yes. And uh, or simply because there are some social media applications that are intentionally organizing their communicative channel in a way that content is meant to be ephemeral. Right. I'm still trying to understand why to save space, to increase FOMO, fear of missing out. I have mm. to watch it now. Mm. I don't know. But the screenshot is a possibility. Although some of these applications are somehow blocking your screenshotting activity or they are communicating to the other person at the other end of the line. This guy is screenshotting you. So this is what we are nowadays. But back in the days, it was just like a way to document lab activity. So mm-hmm. lab were not necessarily open to anybody. Sure. It was very esoteric what was happening there. So in order to communicate that, you have to start inspecting the video from the, uh, an outside point of view. And then little by little, the terminal were changing, the monitors were changing, and also the capturing uh, approaches were, were changing. So technically, this is something that we were doing with uh, Nick Monfort, my supervisor here at the Trope Tank. It was possible to track at a certain moment by doing this research, a moment in time where the wind of, let's say, of screencast mm. movie making, mm. desktop storytelling, feature film realized entirely within a computer screen using the graphical user interface, mostly, not necessarily. You can also use the command line, but it's not going to be maybe that I <laughs> uh, say funny to watch if you're not yeah. an expert. So that window was appearing in media history around 94. 94, mm. 95, mm. possibly 96, the final combination. So you have a software mm-hmm. that was called ScreenCam by Lotus. It was for industry just to to demonstrate software, to have some simulation, to, let's say, right. um, yeah, exchange tutorials, sure. not just the big manuals that are impossible to read, just like a tutorial. So this is what what it is. And then you have Windows 95. You probably don't remember that, but it was a big hype. And, and actually, there was a special on TV uh-huh. presenting you the, uh, the software. And also, there was a, a, a VHS that you can buy with a video... Uh, recording on the screen activity just like this is how you're meant to operate the software and then uh, if you want to add just the extra layer of people because otherwise it's just like a wimp no so windows uh, icons a menu and pointer and uh, then you have to uh, wait for cuc me that was uh, just like a primitive application that was developed at cornell university and it was a way to to talk through uh, early Webcam, so just like very low quality images, black and white. But oh, it was like actually C, like 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 S C E like C U C me. Oh, okay, yeah. gotcha. You can search uh, documentation on wow. the internet; it's wonderful. There was also a book called Internet TV, the TV wow. of the future, because that is the crucial point in my research. On one side, you have the history of screen recording, but then the moment you have a webcam, it could be external, it could be embedded. Like nowadays, you, you barely notice that. You also have the infamous or famous counter shot in cinema it's always important to establish a relationship between somebody who is looking at something it's all about the gaze no so i'm looking at you you're looking at me i'm speaking at you you're listening to me so in cinema you want to intercut that and the interaction between me and a computer is that i'm looking to the computer and the computer is somehow speaking back to me through the interface but if i have a webcam i will be within the computer so usually the webcam is there because I'm using my webcam, <clears throat> you're using your webcam, and we can talk to each other. So while I transmit my webcam to you, I'm not looking to me, possibly. I'm looking to you. Although I know this has some people in Skype uh, back in the <laughs> days, and also during the pandemic, they get lost in their steps. Like, 
Uh, but the moment I want to stay with your computer and maybe it's you talking to your mother while, I don't know, adjusting your expenses on Excel and checking your email and browsing the internet, all of those things are in, in the screen. So I don't necessarily need to film you. I can stay with the screen because you're already within that. Hmm. So the moment you have those, those two things together, you can legitimately have a, a screencast movie. So the window was there around 96, let's say, 95, 96. Right. But then we have to wait until films like Unfriended 2014 huh. to have the same idea on a mainstream level. There should be, first of all, the technical possibility. So the window should be appearing. But then the next step is just like people are using this possibility. So it's not that people were not using Windows 95 plus screen cam plus CUCME. Maybe they were doing that, but maybe in different ways. Maybe they were just using two of the three parameters, just like Windows and screen cam, because I want to demonstrate MS Paint. Maybe I'm using Windows and CUCME because I want to talk with my mother. But what if I do the triplet? Right. I was thinking about similar Example, so you have the double bass in jets is play with your fingers. I mean, we don't know about people in the 18th century or 17th century if they were approaching the double bass in a jetsy way. Mm -hmm. Usually they use a bow, right? Right. But this, and they were sitting. The moment jets arrive, people are standing and they're just. Yeah. So the, the technical possibility is there since day one. But let's say the four steps would be technical feasibility mm -hmm. and then interest and curiosity. And then broader adoption. So now people in, I don't mm. know, 2003 are using computers pretty much increasingly more. And then the broadband is getting better and Skype or other services yeah. easy to use are arriving. But maybe not necessarily a lot of people want to video chat because there is not a real need for that. Mm. And so the final step would be to have a narrative reason to do that. Mm. So that's why those films are now blooming up right. because the pandemic familiarizes people we were forced to be using certain software so now it's acceptable even for my mother or for my grandmother to watch a film of 90 minutes that is set within a computer because not necessarily my grandmother but my mother was teaching in fact on a computer yeah. so she knows about that right. so at the very early stage is for tech people Meaning tech could also be tech double bass players, just like right. people that are that have the technique yeah. that are there, close yeah. to this kind of arrangement. Yeah. Right. And then the second step would be some crazy thinker or or tinkering mm. person within mm. that community, possibly within the community, because you could be crazy and thinkering, but you don't have access to a broadband. So you should be maybe in the right place in the right moment. And then the third place would be this adoption for some commercial reason. So, right. for example, I suppose the pandemic was hitting before. We could have been experiencing a different oh, yeah. no, patch. Just like, let's right. go for video conference right now in 2005. It's feasible. Why don't we do it? Now we have to do it. And then the final thing is that, okay, you live through that. You know what, what happens. Mm. Now I can make a film about that. Mm. Because if I make a film about something that you don't know, it's like a command line desktop narrative. People are just like, what is that? Is it the Matrix? Is it the, the initial scene with the crazy hackers? And then, but one hour and a half of people typing, uh, I'm not following you. Sorry. So it depends who the audience is. Do you remember like Google Glasses or mm -hmm. things like this? Like the, this existed at MIT in like the early 90s, but only became a thing kind of in 2010 and like still not. And now there's like Microsoft HoloLens, which like mm -hmm. uses like AI to like improve things for like workers. This is incredible as a story, different use of the same technology. So gunpowder, mm -hmm. gunpowder. We call it like that because we use it for the gun. The Chinese were using that for uh, fireworks. Mm -hmm. This is like you can kill somebody or you can have a, a colorful show in the sky. Right. The, with Nick, uh, we now have uh, contributed to uh, the, the glossary um, of a book that is uh, just came out. It's called The Lab Book. It's a history of the lab as a space within mm. academia and also other places, just like this idea that uh, you can learn through tinkering, not necessarily in the scientific STEM world, also in the humanities. But there is a final part that is a glossary, and they want to keep that final part open. So there is a call for application, call for action, call for proposal, just like if you have a practice that you've been experimenting with in your lab and you have a word 
could also be a, a pun, it could also be just mm. like a keyword that you invented, that you associate with that practice, and that is resonating also with the lab itself, please send it out. So our word is a retroduction. It's some species of retrocomputing, but uh, we are focusing on the branch of it that involves media making, so media production. It's not mm. about playing video games on old computers or producing video games that maybe are uh, similar to 8-bit, yeah. uh, uh, I don't know, adventure game. We replace the pro with the retro to indicate that this practice is turned towards the past. Huh. And that is the idea. Right. So the thing is, uh, to distinguish retroduction from other current approaches, we reverse the idea of technostalgia. Instead of expanding or building on past superseded formats, we explore unexpanded past technology hmm. that did not find their cultural expression. Hmm. So this idea of setting up a machine right. that is a legit Pentium 2 or Pentium 3 <laughs> with a Windows 95, with a screen cam software, with a CUCME, possibly webcam, and then you produce with that kind of portal in time. Right. So it's not about retromania, it's not about uh, huh. retrofuturism, it's not about vintage. Mm -hmm. We're not uh, nostalgic, also because you cannot be nostalgic of something that didn't happen. I mean, just like we're trying to replicate the possibility and the feasibility of an arrangement. And this could be a very interesting experiment in track down the history of the format. So it's not a documentary. I mean, we can document the process, but if we end up producing something, it will be a mockumentary. So we are pretending that we are in 95 mm. using this kind of technology, but in fact, we're not. Mm. But we can make a point. So just like uh, we have this idea about windows opening in time. Yeah. We have this idea of adoptions and then uh, uh, narrative structure that are modeled upon the familiarity of people with this kind of arrangement that originally was there but not mm -hmm. explored. Now we want to prove the point by getting our hands dirty as in a scientific lab. Right. So maybe in the process of doing that, we will encounter a lot of errors in fact we encountered a lot of problems just like especially while thinking is this computer going to be connected or not because the protocols are different there is no real protection so it's very complicated like technical so, errors here so you, you don't want to wow. so, and also and that's why uh and where i'm happy to be here because i'm not a computer scientist mm. i've been uh, using computers all my life mm. thanks to my father but uh i was barely opening them so just like i'm a very good user i know a lot of tricks i know my software i i play around with data and i'll play around with the full making possibility within the computer but i cannot code right. maybe that could be an incentive uh to start huh. to investigate also this other side which is the ultimate paranoid uh, you know more than paranoid would be uh over zero so maybe just like uh opening up new possibilities so hacking into the machine in fact and so I have a surprise for you. It's not going to be an examination. God. I know that here nearby you have the, how do you call it? The Hall of Horror? Uh, yeah, Hall of Horror is good. I mean, there's no official name, but it's just how I think of it. It's like Lair of Doom or, so I guess I should just say for, for the video's sake there, yeah. this office is right next to the MIT like gymnasium, which is converted into the like permanent exam center. So there's, I'll put a picture on, I guess. Yeah, it was really spooky for me. I didn't know anything about it. I had chills on my spine seems like a concentration camp yeah it's so like you feel the suffering the previous <laughs> pain yeah the air is thick in there um it's where i like borderline failed many exams and all sort of stuff so anyways um yeah like layer of doom uh hall of horror like any of these uh, okay. this is the vibe so okay. yeah so it's not gonna be any of that actually the opposite <laughs> so i was trying to put myself uh on a deadline uh, because of this interview, because I'm, I'm, I'm leaving the country after seven months uh, in uh, five days. So I really wanted to be here. I really like this kind of uh, approach. Also, the fact that you're moving from people on the purely technical side to artists or creative mm -hmm. professionals that are somehow touching on something that could be expanded. Mm -hmm. no? And that's why Lupe is here, mm -hmm. rap and computational uh, poetry or maybe coding. Mm -hmm. I'm here because, you know, user interface, uh, human computer interaction, mm -hmm. retrocomputing. Mm -hmm. So everybody is in his own little pet, but uh, definitely is uh, valuable the fact that MIT has an open mind for mm -hmm. eccentricity and experimental <laughs> crazy stuff and hacking as a philosophy, not just hacking computers, but hacking 
ideas, hacking mm-hmm. the buildings. In fact, I ended up discovering a lot of vernacular uh, oh, let's say, happenings. Mm-hmm. I really respect this kind of uh, subculture of mm. uh, dorm uh, geniuses, <laughs> just like trying to play around with the architecture of right. the Institute, which is a, a monster, no? it's something that is menacing. Mm. At the same time, it's interesting that they still allow you to play a little bit around with mm-hmm. that. I mean, they're, they're clearly restricting this kind of window, in fact. It's less, yeah. But uh, it's still there. That's so right. uh, I was trying to organize my thoughts and wrap my mind around my own self because, as I was telling before, I study myself a lot. So this is important to underline. I'm not intoxicated by my own self or thinking that I, I am the best. I'm actually very confused by the way my mind works because the best thoughts are always coming at night or mm. say uh, when you're doing something else at least for me so at the moment people are just I like agree. okay i have a terrible day i need to sleep i also had pretty busy days especially here but the moment i i lay down just like my mind is full with ideas that are recombinant because in fact leaping especially dreaming is about editing you know so all the footage that you took then it's rearranged mostly unconsciously but there is that precious and slippery and faithful moment before you fall asleep into the the arms of Morpheus, Mm -hmm. then you have to say, oh, wow. So basically, I've been taking a lot of notes Mm. uh, in these six months and on scattered devices, just like before sleeping, it's usually the phone. could be audio notes, could be just like me in the dark trying to to write something, to, to fix an idea that is visiting me. It's not my idea, it's visiting me because of all the stimulation mm. of previous hours or days or weeks. So that is one. And then I've been uh, using two computers. One was sitting in the, in the lab, one was at home. So I was using some cloud service. I'm not very happy with cloud services, but here it was relevant because then I was communicating with myself. So from here, I was communicating to the future self mm-hmm. at home. Mm-hmm. And from my house, I was communicating to the future self in the next morning here. So that is also a part of this kind of uh, database. And then retrieving the notes pre-pandemic, during the pandemic and post-pandemic, just like what I was thinking before COVID arrived, so this is a very experimental mm. project and people were happy about that. And then in the process of renegotiating my Fulbright appointment, people were just like, oh, so you choose a uh, desktop narrative because of the pandemic. No, 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 no. I'm here waiting because of the pandemic. The topic was already <laughs> there, unfortunately. Right. The situation heavily impacted not only on the logistics of me coming here, but also my reasoning. In fact, I have a research blog, which is dynamic. It can change over time. Right. I can collect ideas. I can follow also the paths of the pandemic. Mm-hmm. And so I had notes that I left untouched. I wanted to remember what I was thinking before but the pandemic, when the world was not conceiving even the possibility, although it was pretty obvious that sooner or later you have film speculation, reports. But anyway, so we were not thinking. Or even the first phase of the pandemic, we were not envisioning the, the craziness of just like curfew, lockdown, vaccine, uh, anti-vaccine debates, struggling uh, uh, politicians, uh, economy. Okay, so I wanted to keep this memory. Right. So I have pre-pandemic notes, during the pandemic notes, first and second, uh, let's say, season, because just like a TV series, right? And then we have uh, pre-Fulbright uh, okay. notes. MIT notes, my notes at night. So basically, okay, I'm going to print everything. Let's see what happens. And okay. I never did that because I didn't take my time to rearrange. So thanks to you. <laughs> These are all my all my notes. So uh, look at this. It's something like 60 pages. Oh, my God. And some is in Italian. So yesterday, <laughs> I, w- I was studying my notes, like me studying my teenage videos, trying to understand because... I've been researching with Nick on retro computing mm-hmm. and then ending, ending up uh, crafting that retroduction mm-hmm. entry for the glossary of the lab book, the open-ended final part of the publication. I've been conducting my research on the history of screenshot and then screencast and then screencast movies within the video art or net art world, ending up with this mainstream possibilities and possibly track down the past, the, the present and the near future. Mm-hmm. Also considering that Smartphone are I'm, I'm becoming prominent, and this is a whole different world. It's not multitasking and multi window, it's monotasking with application. It's not horizontal, it's vertical. It's not even mm. with a cursor that you can follow. Even if I'm not there, you can follow the pointer with the haptic device 
you will get confused because things are happening, popping up. You cannot anticipate that. So even in a that's the movie, you're not necessarily always following the cursor, but unconsciously, you in fact some movies are focusing on the cursor, some movies right. are panning and zooming, and some others are steady. But even if they are steady, you can follow the cursor. On the cell phone, everything is different. So hmm. all of these notes are, let's say, 30% from the past. Yeah. 34% from my research, mm -hmm. personal, and 30-40% from MIT. So the game would be, you know the I Ching, the book of changes? So people open up the book and mm -hmm. try to see the configuration. Ah, uh, yeah. It's uh -huh. like, okay, let's interpret that. See if there are some expression, some ideas capturing your attention. For sure. Wow. I just am getting a scope of things. Yeah, just like wow. it's, it's, I'm gonna, I'm, is... I'm, in fact, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm throwing them at you. Yeah. <laughs> Your brain for the past three yeah, years. Yeah, this is my brain, uh, wow. Reader's Digest, uh, 2020 <laughs> to 22. And half of this is possibly from the latest months. Let's pick up something that you find. Just yeah. selling so points. So you, you write, home is where I lay my head. Home is where I place my laptop. And then you write, home, home is, is where, where Wi-Fi is. is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Th Tell those are reflections that have to do with... Uh, this idea that I was already investigating even before desktop narratives. So you have my interest in hikikomori. We were discussing briefly uh, off camera. So the syndrome of people in Japan, just like uh, being more and more reclusive to the point of not leaving their house or even their room anymore. So just like living surrounded by all sort of machines, devices, and uh, prosthesis that can help you survive through delivery of information, of food, of goods, maybe doing some little remote working, but not necessarily. So this was a fascination of mine already years ago. And then, of course, this has strong connection with the culture of Japanese otaku, manga collectors, and also mixed media before Transmedia arrived in the States, it was heavily discussed also by one of the co-founders of CMS, Comparative Media Studies, namely Harry Jenkins, that now is in California. This idea of Transmedia storytelling with different entry points to the same media franchise. In Japan, they were already doing that with mixed media mm. in the in late 70s and in the 80s, just like these subcultures of manga lovers and combining music, uh, t-shirts, and just like fan fiction right. contributing to the core. So... The moment you combine this heavily reliance on, uh, let's say, uh, media consumption, also niche consumption, or just like a very compulsive, uh, almost uh, maniac uh, obsession with some uh, specific mm -hmm. uh, geeky, we would say nowadays, or nerdy mm -hmm. uh, product, plus the isolation, plus the confined space of a room, you have an anticipation of a lot of things, of the solipsism, of the gig economy. Mm -hmm. like Everybody is his own entrepreneur, his own secretary, right. his own yeah. uh, PR, no? uh, and um, of the pandemic as well. In fact, I was writing a, a little entry on my blog called Ikiko Memento Mori. So the Memento Mori, beware, you're going to die. Everything is perishable. There is vanity all over the place. Maybe the Ikiko Mori were there already indicating us the road, just like leading the this kind of silent revolution it could be also an involution just like you are introspecting so that is why can you read it again home is where i lay my head home is where i place my laptop home is where the wi-fi is yeah so of course home is where i lay my head so maybe you have a hobo in the street mm -hmm. he has a favorite bench mm -hmm. that is home right mm -hmm. it's because it is where you sleep all right so the shelter in fact shelter stands for house but uh it's also a way to cover yourself from the elements, right? Yeah. So definitely home, what we call home, is where we can rest. Mm -hmm. Somebody is able also to rest around the world while traveling, but most of the people, I mean, we are steady, you know? We, we, we yeah. tend to stay in a place. I also am willing to be back in my home. <laughs> Not necessarily to lay my head, but to be surrounded by my things. So mm. a little bit of an otaku database animal <laughs> thing there. Yeah. So home is where my head is. Home is where my laptop is because the laptop it's supposed to be movable but then in the end when you're gonna use it different from the phone yeah. you are searching for a surface to, to put the laptop on i have something i can read so we can do this uh, crazy <laughs> quotation uh, game i was reading and uh, elaborating about this hikikomori syndrome and uh, um, thinking about this idea of having a, a room verse so just like it's a universe that is sitting in a room yeah. and the room has some uh, screens and the screen is full of other multiverses. So mm -hmm. you have a, a house full of room, 
a room full of screen and a screen full of other houses of other rooms. Mm. So you have this brand new room verse. Also, I was thinking to organize this idea with room verse, like in a song, and then you have a room chorus. So a QR of people just like silently joining in the metaverse mm -hmm. from different outposts, mm. different yeah. cockpit, different right. cocoons, right? So I was writing this. Um, Laptop are considered to be portable computers, but in fact, they're not, or not totally. Most of the time, they're not even laid or cradled on our belly, as the name would imply, almost cyborganically suggest, on your lap, but simply placed on some flat surface, operated for a limited amount of time, and then literally removed. So the laptop is primarily a transportable object, sort of digital suitcase you carry around and open just once it has been safely lent somewhere stable. So it has been conceived as a tool to move with, but in the end, it seems that now it's better virtually mobilizing snippets of your own room instead. So you're traveling with your room, but then the moment you place your room, your digital universe hmm. there, that is where home is. Hmm. So home is where your head is, or your laptop, and then possibly a Wi-Fi. Hmm. Oops. Wow. That's okay. Um, and this is part, I mean, so, so you, you touched on something that I didn't touch already. Yeah. And this is out of the magical power of synchronicity. So I'm just like, my notes, me evaluating myself and discovering a lot of things because of this interview. So thanks for that. You pushed me <laughs> to do this mess. And now you are transversing. No, this is excellent. Um, something I certainly need to ask you about. Oftentimes in communicating with you, you will ha write a word and then have like parentheses or oh, yeah. brackets, brackets inside yeah. the word. And so just as an example is how's life treating you in the word treating, you have an H in parentheses. Oh, yeah. So you can read this line as how's life treating you or how's life threatening you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, you don't have to read this two separate times. If you look at it, you can kind of just, it's both at once. Yeah, that is the beauty. That is the beauty because uh, phonically uh -huh. we tend to be, uh, yeah, a monophonic, no? Mm. So just like uh, we can sing in a choir, but we cannot necessarily multiply ourselves. Although mm -hmm. some people in some videos <laughs> they multiply themselves. <laughs> if you are a multi instrumentalist and you want to play with a, an orchestra of selves, right. you can do that. And you can also add a link about this other strand of my research, but we're not going to go there. Yeah. Visually speaking, instead, uh, the world is full of details. Actually, I'm looking at you now. I can also look at the camera, but the room is full of things. And I can also look through the door to the whole of ours. I mean, just like even in a, in a cinema space, you watch a film and you want to watch it again and just like you already watch it. Yeah, but how many things? But in general, even a photo, photo of your best friend. I mean, how many details you're not looking at? So mm -hmm. instead of uh, just bending the words like it happens in rap, but you hear it, so it's more about the meaning, I try to bend them on a visual scale. And the good part is that you can read it in your mind twice or you can tell somebody, oh, you know, I've, I encountered this crazy uh, visual pun, but then you have to explain. But yourself as a reader, the moment you are looking at it, you're not just a reader, you're a spectator because you are envisioning two or three layers of the same word, not talking about meaning like... Uh, in, uh, in the Bible, or the Divine Comedy, or, or Lu <laughs> Lupe Fiasco's raps. Yeah. It's just like, I'm talking about a meaning that is already there. It's just like a, a potentiality, you know? Mm -hmm. So another line that I was uh, crafting is basically, we moved in cinema from spectators mm, to spectators with a C. Just need a C to become an actor. And then you are ready to be one of the protagonists of the Death of Cinema. Just one sea of difference. But telling you, you know, spectators and then spectators. Isn't it funny? Is that, nah, maybe. But if you read it, mm -hmm. it's like, so I, I play a lot with parentheses, brackets, and also underscore, and uh, I don't know, slash. Yeah. And this is uh, very confusing for my editors if I'm publishing articles. Yeah. And also, sometimes it's considered to be inappropriate, especially in academic circles. It's like, well, what are you doing here? I mean, come back to the fun. So school is not about fun. Here is where the fun dies, no? I hate this fucking place. All these kind of mementos. Instead, I mean, if you write... Uh, also critical theory, especially about media, that is something that is manipulating your perception in a... Not necessarily funny ways. We're not making comedy here, but we yeah. are trying to trigger the imagination and possibly play around with words. 
Marshall McLuhan, one of the fathers of uh, media studies, uh, the medium is the message is already a powerful idea. No? You can s- mm. sit and concentrate and meditate on that as a mantra for one year. And then one day he was committing an error to say the medium is the massage, the massage. So, wow, this is good. I'm going to write another book with this other title. It's just like it was welcoming wow. this uh, uh, incidents. Also the room verse and the room chorus. So you have the universe, mm. you have the room verse, and then you have the room color. So there are three steps. The universe is one, universe, and you have the multiverse. So maybe you can have a, a multitasking activity, mm. a multi-window arrangement on your computer, mm. or a multi-room environment. Right. So you can have also... A room verse but then the verse what is a verse it's the direction that you take mm. in italy we say verso i'm going towards something but also it's the verse of a song so you have a chorus so you can have a room verse and a room chorus and you can go on and go on, and go on. Mm. so it's different from what lupe mm. does mm. or from the allegorical mm-hmm. uh, layers of maybe a prophecy book because it's not hiding the meaning it's just like pushing sometimes physically enlarging the world to accommodate other little inserts. Yeah, like similar to what I was talking about with Lupe, like in in a, in a different way, but it's kind of compressed data transfer. Oh, yeah. Um, and also to me, as an Italian uh, mother tongue speaker, how's life treating you is already super interesting. We don't say that. Hmm. We say, come va la vita, how life is going. So life is there. And it's going mm-hmm. on and you there is some mm-hmm. agency in life that mm-hmm. is. So to me, this is menacing already. Okay, you can start a seminar on that, just like with the little age mm-hmm. and the seminar I started. Yeah, you I know? think it's great. Um, let okay, let, let's, let's go on. Let's go. Here. Um, so yeah, one theme, you pick up one theme that is room. The room verse, ikikomori, isolation, solipsistic realm, uh, yeah, solitary. Mm-hmm. endeavor enterprises and then of course the pandemic and the idea that everybody is somehow coping with his own ghosts in his own little room nowadays because everything could be in a computer so by the time i was going to university i remember my father's car was full of things i mm-hmm. wanted all my media stuff around so a guitar a stereo my collection of books my tapes video cassette recorder the monitor yeah. by the time i was enrolling in the second part of my university uh as I experienced in amsterdam everything was except for the guitar in the computer so we ended up in smaller and smaller spaces also because the rent are getting <laughs> high all over yeah. the place boston is crazy yeah and uh, at least we don't have to carry all those things around so this is one major theme mm-hmm. that you pick just right away yeah very good yeah beautiful let's um, go on let's see these are mine what's this um oh yeah for sure i have to do that one it just says don't fuck with cats Oh, <laughs> that was okay. okay, that is, okay, so <laughs> interestingly enough, that is the rabbit hole of my room verse uh, analysis because I was subdividing the activity that you can have in a room uh-huh. uh, between euphoric activity and mm. dysphoric activity. Okay. So utopian room and dystopian room. And mm. that's why I also ended up with the name Disktopia because if the mm. room is the computer and if the computer is a very graphical user interface presenting you with a desktop, not necessarily with a smartphone anymore, but definitely for laptop or regular computer using and also for study, research, and just like concentration. And even during the pandemic, people were coming back to computer because you had to live there. So you don't want to live here. You want to live there. Mm-hmm. So um, the dystopia could be the topos of the desk where you place your virtual mm. desktop but also could be utopian let's say adventure or a dystopian a terrifying situation you could be forced into your desktop because there is a pandemic out there or maybe you could be enjoying your time but getting lost there so i was experimenting with this uh, uh let's say also sociological um secondary pet and trying to uh learn about people that conducted incredible things in their bedroom people inventing the next uh, big thing on the market. Usually it's like a garage or it's a dorm room mm-hmm. and all those startup stories or the opposite, just like uh, killing rooms, snuff rooms. And those are the, the cats. So there is this guy, Luke Magnotta. Uh, there is a documentary about him, Don't Fuck With Cats. Basically, this guy was originally transmitting the killing of cats 
Jeez. through a webcam from his own room uh-huh. in Canada. And then little by little, he started to move from animals to humans. And then he was dismembering humans and documenting everything and was posting those videos online. And then the, there was a, a manhunt. And so he was escaping. He was going to Europe. And actually, ironically or coincidentally, he was caught in an internet cafe. Those kind of things that are somehow midway between private and public. You are basically inspecting your digital room in a public space. Mm-hmm. He was checking on the news about his own manhunt. And, and finally it was blocked. And that is a killer room because everything happened in that room. So people were trying to organize some sort of a treasure hunt before yeah. the authorities got involved because of the cats. So this is the irony. Who is the mascot of the internet? Cats. cats. Meme cats, right? Cats. So he was vacuum killing the cats, just like sucking out uh, hair, yeah. horrible things, okay? So people were just like, you know, 4chan, uh, there were a, yeah. a, a lot of uh, execution back in the days. I mean, my friend would just like, oh, look at this Arab, just like yeah. killing somebody else. Yeah. So, you know, it's like xenophobia, Islamophobia, yeah. all sort of crazy stuff. And then this cat killer was just uh, one of those. But then the community of people, and he's just like, no, 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 you can behead some prisoner. You can, uh, I don't know, bomb the World Trade Center, but you don't fuck with cats. And precisely because of that, they ended up finding him. So I was investigating the killer room, uh, the bedroom to stardom room, and in the middle, the hikomori. Is he killing himself? Is he meditating? Is he a digital monk? What's going on there? Pretty sure this is related, and you circled this one. The window is, in fact, a frame. Oh, yeah. What's that? Yeah, those are, let's say, unexpected twist or uh-huh. outcome in screen theory or in your life or in your relationship with devices mm. because in cinema theory you have the window so transparency documentary naturalistic cinema i'm looking through a windows so there is nothing that is really customized there of course this could be staged or faked right like in gonzo journalism gonzo porn sometimes this is somebody that i just met it's not true but it's recorded with the quality and the, and the shaky camera, just like, hey, I'm here, yeah. here's the money. Yeah. Okay, so this is the wind of mostly documentary and also the beginning of cinema. The Lumiere brothers were documenting things. Hmm. This is a horse. This is a mountain. Hmm. This is somebody hiking. This is a kangaroo. And then little by little, you have constructed cinema with montage, with point of views. So you have the frame. I'm framing. I'm going to compose this image. Hmm. I'm going to play on this trick i'm gonna have this editing and you have the mirror stage in which basically you have the paranoid double check so you are talking about the cinema talking to camera like it happens in the amelie mm-hmm. or maybe a house of cards so the protagonist sometimes is looking at you the spectator is not supposed to happen it could happen in tv yeah. it could happen in a lot of video clip especially hip-hop you're gesturing towards the camera all yeah. the gestures are for the camera hmm. and even in porn once again people are having sex in positions, not necessarily comfortable, they are for the camera, right? right? Yeah. So the mirror stage is where you reflect on the very medium that you're using. Hmm. But there could be some twist. For example, in Truman Show, I don't know if you saw the film, there is a moment in which he's looking at the mirror. That mirror is a one-way mirror. And so basically, he's talking to somebody, just like, I'm out of here. And then I understood. So in fact, the mirror is, hmm. is a window. Mm-hmm. But he didn't know. He realized it. Yeah. Okay. Or what else? Um, Just give me that. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. What is a desktop movie presenting you with? Is it a documentary? Is it a framing device? Mm. Or is it a mirror? Mm. Because also you have black mirror, right? Such so as yeah. at the moment the computer is broken or it's just like it's spitting crazy data at you and it becomes problem so you're just like you're witnessing your own demise right the mirror element to come back very briefly to the idea of how and why i play with language mostly because i I write in english so i play a lot also with the italian Mm -hmm. language but i noticed that while writing in italy first of all i write possibly stories not necessarily theory english is for theory italian is for story because the language of the body the mother the child Mm -hmm. so i usually write crazy story with flamboyant uh, uh jargon I, I borrow terms from other disciplines, uh, just like similar to Chuck Palahniuk. It's, it's a very good writer, strongly recommended. And every book is an exercise in style. Every book is basically concentrating on some specific 
uh, set of terms. It could be from medicine, it could be from uh, occultism. Mm. And every book has a different uh, shape. Mm. So it could be a memoir, it could be a diary, it could be letters, it could be a, an oral history uh, transcribed from tapes. Mm -hmm. So this is the kind of things that I like to do in Italian. Hmm borrowing from different uh, layers of expertise. In English, I like to play with language. I can practice the language, I can manage it, but it's still a little bit far away, yeah. definitely further than you are from the language. So yeah. I can look at that once again hmm. on a meta-narrative, just like, okay, I'm speaking a language. Instead, in Italy, or you're here, you are spoken by the language. How's life treating you? How's the language speaking yeah. you, right? So right. it's like, you speak it, but you don't necessarily think. The moment you step out of that and you say, first of all, I come from a uh, uh, Latin-derived language, so there's the different roots, different way to bend the words. Mm -hmm. It's a technology, right? Mm -hmm. And also, uh, English is uh, then uh, the, the language for most of the things that I describe. So I need to stick to English for computational references or for cinematic references most of them, and digital uh, yeah. media. And so basically, for example, here, I was uh, playing around with also a uh, proposition that we use. So we look at a frame. So the frame is there. We acknowledge that there is a frame. So we're not looking through the frame. We're looking at the frame because it's organized for us. But uh, we look through the window. Now I'm looking at you through the, yeah. the glasses. I'm not concentrating. I, can, I may be concentrating sometimes. So if you give me a, another pair of glasses, I would just like, ah, mm. ooh, because I'm adjusting to the new shape to be forgotten in the near future. Mm. But I'm not looking at the frame. I'm looking at you. Right. So we call this frame, once again, the language. But this is a frame containing a window because I'm not looking at the frame. I'm looking at you through the window. So through the window, at the frame, and into the mirror. Hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So you're looking into the computer, you have a representation of yourself, but in fact, what is there is a frame that is built around an illusion. So there is a command line and the binary code. You're looking at some layers up. Mm -hmm. That's why people, they won't love to use the command line. They don't like to be distracted by flashy icons. Oh, wow. What is that? I don't want to be using a GUI. Sometimes people even refuse the mouse. Yeah. There's a group called Red Poison. They are against the mouse. Fuck the mouse. <laughs> so I'm going to use the keyboard. So it's just like <laughs> the more interfaces, the more you're user friendly sucked in. But let's suppose there is a virus, then the, the illusion stops. Just like, wow. So this is not necessarily uh, a hmm. frame. Something is going on. Maybe it's, it's a window. Or maybe somebody is looking at me like in Truman Show and I don't know about that talking about remote activation on the webcam. So those shifts into the kind of um, meaning and also mm -hmm. function or functionality right. of the, let's say, container, the vessel of information happening in films, sometimes in experimental films. No, So if somebody is looking at you, you were thinking that was just like a frame. In fact, it's a window. Of course, Kevin Spacey is not looking at you, but he's breaking the fourth wall, the so-called fourth wall, no? So there are three walls, and the fourth should never be addressed in the theater. You're not talking to the person. Here is different. So I'm not talking to the camera. We are pretending to have a conversation, but if for some moment I was just like, hey, hello. <laughs> People would be, I mean, especially if we never yeah. consider that it's there, but it's invisible, right? right? Yeah. So you can break this kind of illusion. Right. And so there are films that are breaking this illusion in many ways. Uh, so, for example, even a very famous film like The Ring, Samara is coming out of the TV. Mm. So it's not breaking your mm. illusion, but it's definitely breaking the illusion and the life of some of the protagonists because it's just like, I thought it was the tape. Instead, somebody's is coming out of that. So it's not even a virtual or cinematic window. It's actually an actual window that is established because of par some paranormal, right. crazy stuff. Yeah. So basically, huh. the frame becomes a one-way window when you are sucked into the... TV, like in Pleasantville, or spit out of the TV, right. like Samara, or maybe Videodrome. This is a threshold. This is not a flat surface. This, I can go mm -hmm. through that, and, and things can come at me from that. Mm -hmm. And actually, it happens also with the computer. Through that conventional, conceptual window, I can, in fact, kill somebody if I'm a drone pilot. I can lose a lot of money. I can acquire a lot of money. I can buy things. I can make an appointment. With you i can be hacked i can be destroyed mm. i can also be physically 
damage with i don't know some super flashy light or super loud noise people were organizing zoom bombing stepping into a, a conference screaming like hell flashy images or naked uh, offensive images and then another possibility is just the window is in fact a frame this also happened in truman the reversal and he escapes with the boat fuck you i'm gonna go and then bam is basically smashing the boat against the fake sky so the thing is the window you think it's an open sky an open horizon yeah it's in fact a frame hmm. it happens sometimes in the theater no that you're stepping out of something sure. or some strange movies twin peaks and basically you understand that you are in a simulation so this was not true so i was thinking there was a word out there it's not there actually there was a wonderful episode of a collective film called tokyo exclamation mark three episodes the final episode is about aniki komori and now I'm going to spoil you the end. So beware, <laughs> beware about what I'm about to say. This Ikikomori, it's a very peculiar figure of contemporary Japan, is forced to go out because he falls in love with somebody. And love is so strong that he want to reach this person outside of his house. But by the time he goes outside, he understands that he has spent so many years in his house that nobody is outside. The city is empty. Mm. Everybody is Anikikomori, and then there are robots delivering food. So the whole society hmm. has been transformed. So this is metaphorical, of course, because even if you are Anikikomori, you can still watch the news. If it's, there is any Kikomori epidemic, so it's like nobody is yeah. coming out for some reason, <laughs> you will get right. to know it. Right. But let's suppose you detach from the news, you detach from the web. Maybe you use the web, but not for the news. Just like people in the forest waiting for the end of the war, and right. they're just like, hey, the war is ended 20 years ago. So the metaphor is just like this guy who's feeling a little bit ashamed, thinking, yeah. okay, I'm here while the world is running. In fact, the world is not running. So to conclude, desktop cinema, you're watching somebody operating graphical user interface. It's a window on windows on multi-layer possibilities. <laughs> but it's also a frame because, I mean, you don't know precisely who is operating the machine. You don't know when, why. First of all, you don't know what's going on in terms of the recording because one thing is you have a horror film like a fan footage film play witch project these people went to the woods searching for the, the witch they died horribly or maybe mysteriously and here you have the tape so right. there is a reason there is a motive you found a document so you retrieve some memory right instead with desktop narrative you are watching somebody using a computer when right now because if it's not right now it's in the past and if it's in the past somebody should have been recorded it but why and who hmm. so you don't know if it's really a transparent window mm -hmm. to look through or if it's a frame organized for you hmm. to look at or if it's a mirror that is telling you you're watching this very movie on your computer so the surrounding that you were using one moment before launching this very film is the same as the film that you're watching so maybe it's trying to tell you something. It's a cautionary tale, just like the events that are happening may occur to you. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you're spending your life living like this and you're even watching a film about this. What the hell are you doing? So, you know? Ah, it's beautiful. I love it. Um, let me ask you about this because it's come up a couple of times. So the home invasion to desktop invasion. Okay, yeah. Yeah, this idea that you could be hacked or damaged or uh -huh. just like assaulted through the screen. Uh -huh. It's also an another interesting idea because <clears throat> I'm very passionate about uh, home invasion movies. And, and so basically the idea of home invasion is that you are comfortably sitting in your house and somebody is coming uh, to kill you or to, I don't know, to steal. But some of the other horror, just like you are going in a vacation, oh, this is a summer house, and then the house is haunted or mm. is full with monster or somebody around the house already prepared yeah. the trap for you so you're getting into an ambush right then you have also the element of uh, uh malware just like viruses nowadays it's just like we are okay with viral marketing or viral memes but we are not okay with real trojan right. viruses yeah. as well we are not okay with the pandemic so in fact the pandemic was interested because we had the real virus on a biological level a lot of fake news which is like contamination of information mm -hmm. and then a lot of sad or bittersweet uh, sweet and sour memes about the pandemic oh i went to college although now it's just a glorified skype chat 
And I just paid 50000 for that, but who cares? So you let the computer somehow stimulate you and be the centerpiece of your room, right. maybe a, a empty room just with the computer. Yeah. And what if that threshold is welcoming monsters? So this is the premise of a lot of desktop horror movies, just like I'm in my house, nothing is going to happen, there's nobody there, nobody is entering the room, nobody is smashing the window, I'm not in the woods, I'm okay. But in the end, what happens is that... Uh, the ghost in the machine, as they call it, can infect the computer. And through the computer, with the Internet of Things, maybe, it can make my fridge explode and then I'm going to die. And everything started from there. Mm-hmm. So cyber attacks are real. Mm-hmm. Uh, remote surveillance and monitoring are real. Mm-hmm. Malware is yeah, real. Absolutely. And even the, the extensive tracking and metadata and uh, this algorithm governance, they, we are willing to accept more or less, uh, voluntarily, more or less acknowledging it, mm-hmm. this is also an invasion. So most of the films that are taking place nowadays on a mainstream level on the screen are about some kind of thriller element. So you, you're dealing with your normal life, digital life is treating you well, and then there is an invasion. Right. Maybe you think that you are smarter, but they are outsmarting you on the other end of the line. This is also the ransomware. Very interesting, no? Your data are stolen and just that you want them back you give me money Mm -hmm. but if you want to represent a robbery right now you should probably uh, have somebody with a hood just like hacking into a room and then since the room is empty and everything is happening there you film the computer or you sit in the computer itself meaning that this invasion is perpetrated through a computer but you don't show people you show just the screen so even the robberies now are mostly Mm -hmm. uh, conducted on a cyber level and in order to represent that you want to stay on the screen. Hmm. So this is the two sides of the desktop invasion. You could be the victim or you could be the perpetrator. And right. if you want to document a cyber attack, it would be super interesting to see what's going on on the screen. Instead of just like yeah. back and forth, the person yeah. on the screen, the person on the screen. Yeah. So th- this is another thing that I didn't mention, but it's uh, related to the this idea of framing. So I've, I've always been very passionate about frame within frame. So mm-hmm. Just like inserting frame elements within a bigger frame. So it could be a door it could be a window so you have somebody speaking and somebody else is doing something mm-hmm. uh, outside of the window so the image is meant to distract you you're focusing on the conversation but actually the real thing is happening out there mm-hmm. it happens in Orson Wells mm-hmm. Citizen Kane so windows in windows frame within frame yeah. uh, let's say a split screen contained or nested mm-hmm. so Russian dolls Chinese boxes what happens with uh, the, the graphical user interface it's, it's all about multi-screen so uh this is the necessary and uh, unavoidable uh, evolution because since the 80s uh films started to incorporate monitors so i mean you can have a film Hmm. in the 40s with a a painting or a photograph or a door or a window and this is an allusion to the history of visual culture or to some threshold some sort of uh perimeters that are surrounding us so we end up organizing the space, especially in the Western world, along frames. But little by little, you just incorporate, just like uh, quick and dirty, a screen. Somebody is mm-hmm. watching a movie. Somebody is inspecting, especially a cyber thriller or tech noir. It's like, okay, look at that, zoom, let's enhance it. So the cinematic information, the mm-hmm. frame, and the little mm-hmm. monitor, all different monitors. The moment these monitors become ubiquitous, uh, pocket size and as utilized by everybody you have a problem because it's not about incorporating the monitor into the film actually the whole action mm. or most of the action is happening on the mm. monitor yeah. so you move from having uh, cinematic frames incorporating right. framing elements be it the monitor LCD display mm-hmm. computer uh, digital watch or a smartphone to the opposite so this is the monitor yeah. Yeah. it could be within the frame we can stay in the middle like those TV shows some years ago, Sherlock, just like somebody is receiving a message. You see the message popping up and the person looking at the phone. And then maybe the, the person is moving with, with the message. So you understand that the message is for that person. Mm-hmm. So this is a transitional moment, a little bit hmm. unexpected and unjustified. Why is that? Oh, to avoid losing screen time and concentration and to show at the same time the, uh, let's say, piece of information and the response. Just like showing me and you instead of what you will probably do. Me speaking and you listening. Just like in a Zoom conversation. Both face. And then it's the viewer that's choosing 
who to watch. <laughs> so you can have both. Right. Same for Sherlock. Just like this is shot and the counter shot, or maybe the let's say the triggering and the response, the stimulus and the response. So this is a screen. You can have a screen within a screen. So this is you have a monitor in cinema, or you can be overlaying information, or you can just go within the screen. So just like instead of zooming and incorporating little frame within frame, you're sitting into the main frame, mm-hmm. which is not the main frame of the lab in the 60s, it's the main frame of the storytelling yeah. device. And then little by little, instead of snippets of digital information transmitted through screens in reality, as filmed by a cinematic eye, you will have snippets of reality through windows as transmitted by a graphical user interface hmm. mainframe. Right. All right. Wow. Um, yeah, it's just you have a, it's a very interesting way to think about things. Um, yeah. So, no, I, I wanted to say thank you so much for like this is a real treat for you to print out 60 pages of your thoughts. Like that's crazy. So I oh, really yeah. like like thank you. Oh really yeah, nice. just like I was profiting from the Athena MIT print plan. <laughs> 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 so I never, probably never printed so much, mm. not because of the money, but because the idea of having those texts always there, ready to be re-customized, re- retold, uh, combined, was taking me away from the physical uh, handout. Mm-hmm. This, this is the, the visual equivalent of my mind right now. It's just like suddenly about in little chapters, a little bit uh, confused, but full of insight to be organized, possibly right. in a shape that could be an evolution of the block, incorporating the elements from MIT. So the retroduction, mm-hmm. of course, and uh, this idea that there is a line so we can search for the first, let's say, instance in which people were really screencasting. One possibility yeah. is also the mother of all demos, they call it Douglas Engelbart in California, demonstrating the mouse, demonstrating mm. the very graphical user interface with mm. a projection and his own face. So that is something that could be associated with the early history of screencast, but was just like for a conference. It was not distributed, it was not in the cinema, it was not narrative. And also hypertextual possibility with uh, uh, information configuration. So that mm. uh, Precious and snippery moment in time between the late 80s and the early 90s, in which you have hypertextual possibility, early web, and then graphical user interface becoming prominent. Three ways of just like uh, having multiple information and multimedia information. So, also the physical, the persona is coming into the screen, and that makes screencasting even more interesting because one thing is to looking at command line, it could be interesting, but to a certain degree. Another thing is to look at application, it could be fun. But then the moment people are there, and so hypertext, the early web, and graphical user interface are three things that makes video consumption of information through a computer much more enjoyable, even vicariously afterwards. And then the future, maybe we're now talking about that, is 2022, in a matter of weeks or maybe months, I don't know, you will be headed in this, and maybe <laughs> who knows what's going to happen yeah. biologically, in terms of war, conflicts, and then also economics, but also very simply on the creative side, maybe the next fad will be smartphone, vertically oriented screencast movies. Mm. And everything will be totally rearranged because it's supposed to be consumed just on the smartphone. I cannot envision somebody going to the cinema and watching a film like this. Although the archivist from CMS today just told me that new monitors are arriving and they are flippable because a lot of contents is now Mm. apparently coming so, in a vertical side or maybe you want to use your excel some of my user. friends for coding they'll have vertical monitors because you can see yeah. more of the logic flow um because it's you know coding sentences are usually short rather than oh, yeah. long so you can see more of that. yeah um that's interesting um i think there's also something along with like uh, things that are like landscape orientation has various like visual cues for you that's different from uh, portrait mode yeah um, yeah in fact it's basically landscape which is like having uh yeah. maybe action and story uh-huh. versus maybe observation right uh, could be the sky could be yeah. the human figure sure in its entire <laughs> and or it could be yeah data data yeah. also books i mean uh, books are vertical sure and, and not i mean they are horizontal if you open the book but you're focusing on a page hmm. and the page is organized along a ratio that is similar to the golden ratio has always been like that hmm. Okay, well, let's move to the video. Yeah, right. sounds good. What do you think about that? So just like I want to have a. 
about the desktop in general. Yeah. Um, I So it started out as me being confused at what was going on, basically. Um, and then I understood. So the way I have my desktop arranged is, well, it actually just crashed, unfortunately. But like it's it's always kind of a mess. And it's kind of a good representation of me in a lot of ways. Okay. Um, me, I just have a black background. Oh, yeah. Um, it's just totally black. It's nothing because I need to be able to see all my icons. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's something that I certainly don't think about, but it's interesting. Every time you're on a Zoom call uh, and someone like shares their screen, you see a totally different backup setting. Like, oh, like, why would you set up your computer that way? You know? Um, <laughs> yeah. So, but I, I never thought about it deeper than that. It's just that you'd see everyone and be like, oh, like that's that's a that's a stupid setup or like that sort of thing. Um, yeah. People probably think about that about me. Um, and that's all I thought about it really until I watched your you know, okay. videos that you produce. Well, it's, yeah. it's a very good starting point because first of all, we're always talking about uh, intimate spaces, not like the room, like the home invasion. You're not supposed to share your screen. Maybe by the time you share your screen, if you're a teacher or maybe you're at a conference, you share a second screen, no? right. even if you don't have a second screen, but you, you share something that could be just like not the mirroring effect of your mm -hmm. own screen, but you create an alternative space, which is something like a screening device. So I'm going to put there what I want you to see. I'm going right. to keep here for me, mm -hmm. what I'm not supposed to show you, even if it's not secret. It's just like simply it's, it's me. I want you to just get lost while I'm talking, inspecting my tax records or my background imaging and thinking I'm a jerk, right? right? But uh, with Zoom calls and also with this uh, acceleration and also the the threat of the pandemic. So, right. so I don't think really we were concentrating on our screen. So it happened that little by little, this yeah. possibility to share in the screen, not incidentally, but just like willingly, just like, oh, I'm going to show you something or maybe can you help me with this? I have a problem. So cooperatively, uh, mm -hmm. let's mm -hmm. say, uh, sustain each other. Mm -hmm. That became uh, natural. and But at the same time, it became noticed. So I've been interviewing artists, uh, mm -hmm. theoreticians, and also people of different age, mm -hmm. different gender. Mm -hmm. And so depending on who the person is, mm -hmm. different OS, right. uh, somebody could be more skilled, more expert. Right. Usually the people that are expert tend to guide me through what mm -hmm. they're doing. Just like, I'm going to conduct you here. You don't... No, no, no. Also because the more you organize your things around open uh, software or just like even the command line, the less I can ask. Vice versa, if I just look at the screen full of uh, messy uh, folders, icons and uh, programs and application running, just like, what's, what's going on there? Just tell me. And the person could be saying, I don't know, it's it's a mess. I don't know how to handle that. Actually, I, I want to burn this computer. Can you help me? So at the end, the desktop becomes some sort of uh, remote right. you know, help assistance. So I've been uh, having a lot of fun because... I've been interviewing people that I knew, yeah. And so getting to know them better, or I've been interviewing people that I, that I didn't know, or I've been in, uh, investigating the digital uh, living room of people that I knew in real life, but not necessarily on the digital side. Right. So it's similar to a studio visit. An artist is working in the studio. You can hmm. go there and you look at the studio. You can now look at the studio of Francis Bacon. Yeah. You can have a, a reconstruction of the studio of Vincent van Gogh. But uh, this is different. No? So how you arrange your files? What is your um, internet activity? How many screens do you use? Are you using a mouse? Do you have some external hard drive? Mm. So I record a whole conversation of one to two hours and I edit in real mm. time already, just selecting things. So mm. my face, the interviewee, the screen, us sitting on top of the screen or the, or the bottom. And then I edit again. So I, yeah. I do a second layer in which I edit in terms of timing. Right. So I, I shrink all the information from two hours to maybe 10 minutes, the best moments. And then I also edit visually. So I zoom, I pan, I just like search for information. I, uh, let's say, highlight something because maybe me and you are sitting on your screen. You're telling me about something. So I want to see but it's there and it's a lot of pixelated texture because I don't uh, necessarily want to, uh, let's say, emphasize or, or refine the quality. Mm -hmm. So the moment mm -hmm. I zoom, it should be clear that it's not a window, it's actually a frame. And the mm -hmm. moment you come closer, you see the texture like in a Van Gogh right. Right. Uh, painting. Huh. Wow. Okay. Um, it's really cool. Um, yeah. Yeah. After I watched your videos, the first thing I thought of was like, I wonder what my friends 
computers look like. I don't know. Yeah. I've, I've known them for 15 years. What do their laptops look like? I have no yeah. Idea. Um, well, I will kill to know everything <laughs> about. Not once again. I'm not a voyeur. Yeah. <laughs> also, I don't want to look into the folders. The moment you understand how many folders are there, right? What kind of folders? Uh-huh. If the icons have been substituted, uh, mm-hmm. or maybe what kind of background, what kind of OS? Simple. You will be surprised. I'm still using a pretty old OS. I don't update because mm-hmm. I don't want to mm-hmm. update. But I have a lot of problems. I'm losing mm-hmm. uh, compatibility and, uh, <laughs> and, and 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 let's say possibilities. Right. But I want to stay with a very old. I mean, not very old. It's eight years old, but it's mm. prehistory once again. So that is already revelatory. It's not that I didn't hear mm-hmm. about mm-hmm. Uh, update or that computer is not trying to push me <laughs> every day. It's simply that I don't want. Yeah. Why? There's a story there. That, that, that would be something that I, I ask. Mm-hmm. Right? But I've been yeah. organizing happenings and also a theatrical uh, workshop in which everybody is sharing his own desktop when we talk and we extract data and we take uh, hints and suggestions from each other desktop. And also I've been conducting experiments in which I can uh, transmit my own desktop uh, online I, I did that uh, through a series called Corona Videos during the pandemic. Huh. I was putting my desktop there and people were welcoming just like, what do you want to do? Just tell me. Oh, I want to see. Okay. Just I did that before with you, with the paper, but on the computer. Right. Of course, the most important and the most private things were totally out of the way or impossible to reach or not there. But unless somebody was asking just like, can you trash the whole, <laughs> can you destroy? So just like, I think it's what you want to see. Right. And, and, and then we were starting this conversation and people were just like responding to each other. just like, oh, I want to see that. Oh, I didn't know that. But before the pandemic, right before, two days before the lockdown, I was organizing an event in Rome. I was part of a bigger event. I was just like uh, having my own uh, video art installation in which I was doing that uh, in real time. So I was there. Yeah. The computer was projected with a beamer on the wall. People were physically in, in the room. Hmm. And I was just like, what do you want to do here? Tell me. So this approach was the desktop. The desktopian happenings is me, let's say, taking that screen away, so using another computer or a virtual screen, or just like a secondary desktop or a virtual machine, and building up from scratch a situation that is not the equivalent of my workspace. Just something a little bit metaphysical, just a few mm. folder. Maybe you don't even have the trash bin, you don't even have the, the system folder. Yeah. Maybe you're just sitting mostly on another screen. Mm-hmm. So it's just like there is a machine that is operating as a primary screen. But what I'm showing you is just like a landscape that I'm organizing. And I'm playing with uh, elements, watery reasonings and mm-hmm. windy ramblings. So this spinning of ideas and you have some sound that is representative of the landscape that is right. provided automatically by the system. Mm-hmm. And then I'm playing around with the perception of objects. So I'm using folders as notes, I'm using notes as, uh, let's say, reminders or maybe just like uh, funny jokes to the viewer. Are you looking at me here or me here? What are you looking at? The cursor, me, mm-hmm. the folder, what's going on? And the final thing mm-hmm. uh, would be um, a specific video. Uh, can I? Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. Okay, this is something that is uh, maybe interesting to oops, interesting to comment on because it's different layers. So you think you are in that screen. In mm-hmm. fact, you are in this screen. But no, you are in this screen. So there was a video sitting on another video sitting on Final Cut that was ultimately sitting on Premiere that was sitting full screen on my desktop. And then it's me exploring the other side, so the counter shot. All the application that just like with no effort are presenting you with your face. So all the intricacies and all the difficult mm. um uh, parameters and protocols that you had in the past to have s- something like that mm-hmm. now it's just like it's plenty of them uh, settings of most of the uh, streaming platforms right. so you can play with that and also I was visiting Chicago at that time <laughs> so you have uh, the loop right, which is something you feel trapped in and here <laughs> also playing with your perception because I'm distracting you with me speaking from the subway and uh at the same time, I was sending a photo to myself through WhatsApp. So this is the ultimate point of view. You have the screen, full frame, you have the webcam, and then you have the subjective point of view, which is basically 
the point of view that is always um, neglected in uh, desktop movies because you never see the person and his surrounding and the real machine that is operating. You just see the screen. Once you jump into the screen, you can see the person from the webcam as a window open on the screen, but you don't know where the person is staying. What you see is just the surrounding. Mm -hmm. You don't know what is beyond the screen. Mm -hmm. Is it a window? Somebody else? It's a cubicle? It's a studio? It's in a bathroom? You know the memes of people having right. uh, conferences which in their pajamas and uh, just yeah. like with a fake background. Yeah. Uh -huh. So the information that you have about the user is limited to the point of view of the webcam. There is another fourth wall that is the wall beyond the computer screen. Hmm. That is probably something that needs to be investigated and I will stop here beautiful um so we've talked for some time and i still feel like there's a lot that i don't understand i feel somewhat bad about that but at the same time i'm really like it's it's great to see how much i don't know i guess yeah and well the same for me i mean let's imagine you start to speak about <laughs> dark matter i mean fascinating as a, as a definition one of the best definitions ever dark matter yeah, dark right? material, yeah. but then Probably after 10, 30 seconds, you really <laughs> <laughs> you already lost me. So yeah. I don't know. We well, should try. We I, should try. Yeah, maybe I'd be happy to. But you've done a really good job of describing your thoughts and ideas, and I wanted to really thank you deeply for taking the time and effort to explain it through me. Like, yeah, um, I'm looking forward to editing this. Uh, I'm sad that you're going back to Italy on on Tuesday. There is a possibility for me. To come back definitely in the States, possibly mm -hmm. at MIT. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe we'll see each other again. That would be great.